Now, from the Performance Center at the Disney Institute at the Walt Disney World Resort, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, if we pick the winners. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Disney Institute at Walt Disney World Resort and our 14th annual Siskel and Ebert special called If We Pick the Winners. This is the program where Gene and I tell you who the Motion Picture Academy would honor at the Oscars if they were as smart as we are. <laughs> I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Why is our Oscar special different from all others? Well, we don't predict who's going to win. We're critics. We tell you who we would vote for if we had ballots. And why are our Oscar votes different from those made by members of the Academy? Well, unlike most of the Oscar voters, we've actually seen all of the nominated films. <laughs> and unlike the Oscar night on TV, you don't have to wait two long hours till you get to the big categories on our show. No. Roger begins right up top by introducing the nominees for Best Actor. Okay, and I'll do that right now, Gene. Here are the nominees in the Best Actor category. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> Nicholas Cage played an alcoholic who determined to drink himself to death and leaving Las Vegas. It was a daring, no holds barred performance. Oh, you're bleeding. Um, wait, wait, yeah. hold it. There's glass in here. I'm like oh. a prickly pear. Richard Dreyfuss was a musician who never intended to become a high school teacher, but discovered his true vocation in Mr. Holland's opus. What do you think the girl's really feeling here? I don't know. You have to know. Or you can't sing it. Anthony Hopkins didn't use makeup or tricks to look like Richard Nixon, and yet his performance was uncannily convincing in Nixon. When they look at you, you see what they want to be. When they look at me, you see what they are. Sean Penn played a convicted man who initially lacks any acceptance of his own guilt in Dead Man Walking, a deeply moving role. I won't take a lie detector test. What? A lie detector test. I know it ain't going to change them guys' minds, but I want my mama to know the truth. I want my mama to know I didn't kill any kids. And the late Massimo Troisi was a simple village mailman who becomes friendly with a great poet in The Postman. Con la poesia posso far innamorare le donne. Come... And Gene votes for Nicolas Cage in Leaving Las Vegas. I think he did a good job. My selection comes from a very strong list. Easily, I could have picked Anthony Hopkins or Sean Penn. Terrific work by both of them. But I'm selecting Nicolas Cage because he constantly brings something fresh to a character who seemingly doesn't change very much during the course of this film. Think about it. He wants to kill himself in the very first scene of this picture and also in the last. Now that must have challenged and liberated Cage. Cage must have said to himself, okay, so what else am I going to do with this guy? It looks like I'm with the right girl. The decision? He opens himself up to this woman who loves him, first with a drunken smile and then with a portion of his heart in this beautiful scene of confrontation and tenderness. Both know I'm a drunk. And I know you're a hooker. I hope you understand that I'm a person who is totally at ease with this, which is not to say that I'm indifferent or I don't care. I do. It simply means I trust and accept your judgment. He's so relaxed and calm there. That catches us by surprise. And there I think you can say why I've said so many times over the recent years that Nicolas Cage is one of our very best risk-taking actors. Well, Gene, I agree with you, and in fact, I agree with you so much that I would just advise you to look in that envelope that you oh, have in your tuxedo okay. pocket there. Well, you must have been thrilled to see my pick. Oh, I was. Yes, it's always nice to see you learning. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is, Nicholas Cage. That's right, Nicholas Cage. I thought long and hard like you did about both Anthony Hopkins and Sean Penn, and mm -hmm. those are really three great performances, yep. but Cage's performance had for me the greatest emotional impact. Pretend that you don't. What I responded to the most was the way he deals with the overwhelming fear that walks with him every step of the way. He's afraid for two reasons. One, he's given up on life. I came here to 
drink myself to death. And two, in the scenes where the fear is the worst, he is undergoing withdrawal from alcohol. That's what's happening here as he tries to cash a check and is simply too shaky to go through with it. I had brain surgery. Why don't I go get some lunch and then uh, we'll, we'll come back and take care of it then. Cage doesn't play it safe for one second in leaving Las Vegas, and although there are countless pitfalls involved in playing a drunk, and you can get bad laughs if you're not careful, he avoids all of them. Well, I'm, I'm going to go to the scenes that are the quieter scenes, mm -hmm. because in uh, anybody with an addiction, whether it's drugs or alcohol, on screen, we're used to scenes of shaking mm -hmm. and all of that. But the calm that he has, he's at peace with himself yes. at some point and at many points in this picture. And they are deeply in love with each other, and he doesn't hide his ability to have love. He dies for a different reason at the end of that film than he had at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's still a tragic and a very sad story, but nevertheless, it's a great performance. This young man is only 32 years old. He's made two pictures a year for the last six years. We're watching a great career, mid-career and it's going to really take off. You're right. All right, now let's move on to our next category, Best Supporting Actress, and the nominees are... Why are you cutting yourself off from the rest of us? Joan Allen played the embittered chief executive's first lady in Nixon. You're hiding. Hiding what? Whatever it is you've always been hiding. Kathleen Quinlan was the suffering wife of an astronaut in Apollo 13. Something broke on your daddy's spaceship. And he's going to have to turn around before he even gets to the moon. Mira Sorvino played a giddy hooker in Woody Allen's Mighty Aphrodite. Pull the string. Pull the string? Yeah, pull all the string. Oh. I'm happens? not so mechanical oh, as I was. Here. Yeah. Oh, it's easy here. Ah, see, it opens. <laughs> Mayor Winningham portrayed the older, responsible sister of a wired would be singer in Georgia. Sadie's out there gobbling it up. Always. That's always how I see you. Gobbling it up again. I hate the desperation. And Kate Winslet hungered for true romance, but was bitterly disappointed in Sense and Sensibility. He made us all believe he loved you. He did. He did. He loved me as I loved him. <laughs> Here's Roger's envelope. Joan Allen in Nixon. That's right. My choice is Joan Allen. And I think the more you look at her performance as the president's wife in Nixon, the better it gets. I want a divorce. There might have been a temptation to sensationalize the character of Pat Nixon, but Joan Allen sees deeper than that into a private woman who has made an accommodation with the fact that her husband is addicted to public office and she hates it. You can read the whole history of their relationship in her face. If we stay with you, you'll take us down with you. This isn't political, Dick. This is our life. Everything's political, for Christ's sake. I'm political. You're political, too. No, I'm not. I'm finished. Joan Allen plays Pat Nixon as a woman with a very strong sense of self, of her own dignity, who does not wear her heart on her sleeve, but it does feel sometimes that she is valued more as a campaign asset than as a wife. It's a strong, brave performance. Now you're the one who's learning something. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> and I suppose that I might as well not even bother to open it before yeah. saying that your choice is... Yeah. See, and they always think we disagree on our show, you know? Joan Allen and Nixon. Yeah. <laughs> this one... Um... This one was pretty easy for me. Joan Allen is my pick. It's the juiciest role in the most serious of the nominated films. I think Joan Allen goes beyond simply embodying the classic cold fish wasp stereotype. I think her Pat Nixon stands for a lot of women who stick by their workaholic husbands and never get to live out their own lives. Where should be going. The primaries are soon, aren't they? In New Hampshire. I love you, buddy. I need you. The behavior that I like looking at by Joan Allen in Nixon is when she allows herself to be talked into giving this man she'd like to leave, but at some level still loves, another chance. We can really change things, buddy. We got a chance to get it right. We can change America. It's our dream, buddy, together, always. Do you really want this, Dick? Yeah, this above all. And then you'll be happy. Yeah, you know I will. Yes, I will. Yeah. <laughs> then I'll be there for you. Of course, she looks oh, remarkably so like nice. Pat Nixon, but on a more significant level, Joan Allen in this Oscar-worthy role looks like so many 
so many generations of very dutiful women. And you know, there's another thing you can see right at the end of uh, this last clip we saw, and that is she does love Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. And she finds that although he's sometimes impossible to live with and she grows frustrated by this role, she doesn't like the attention. She says at one point in the movie that she just campaigned too much. She just can't go out there and be a public person anymore. Nevertheless, she is loyal to him. And it's interesting how all of those complex emotions come out in a very quiet and restrained performance. That's true. And then also, aging on film, you, it's a pitfall. They can look bad. In I mean, she's dead close up there, extreme close up. And this is a woman, an actress, I think, in her late 30s. And there she's playing someone at least 20 years older, mm -hmm. at least. And uh, totally convincing in the role. It's a terrific performance. When we come back, we will give our choices for best supporting actor. Okay, pulp quiz. Which bags the fight, grabs a cab, and calls it a day. So, what did director Quentin Tarantino think of this scene? You won't know until you see the bonus scenes that follow the movie in the special collected edition of Pulp Fiction. Buy it today. Hello, Marco. Madame? Hello, Marco. Good afternoon, Madame. Marco? Hello, Marco. Smart Pop. 94% fat free. Hello, Marco. 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 100% carefree. Smart Pop. From Orville Redenbacher. There's a place. It's not on any map. But once you're there, you'll know. Imagination is love. The border, pure fantasy. And the natives are quite friendly. So visit whenever you like. Because this is your journey. We just make the arrangements. U.S. satellite broadcasting. You can see everything from here. The most talked about movie is now on sale. Siskel and Ebert call it a wild ride. That a fact. It's Pulp Fiction, a special collector's edition with bonus scenes that follow the movie. Ooh. The collector's edition of Pulp Fiction. Buy it today. From the Performance Center at the Disney Institute, Siskel and Ebert, if we pick the winners. Welcome back to the Disney Institute at Walt Disney World Resort and our annual Siskel and Ebert special, If We Pick the Winners. This is the show where we say who we would vote for if we were Academy members. The next category is Best Supporting Actor, and here are the nominees. James Cromwell was the crusty old farmer who brings home an orphan pig and babe. Get him up, pig. He wants you to drive them out of the yard. Away from me, pig. Remember, you have to dominate them. Ed Harris played the director of mission control, guiding endangered astronauts back to Earth in Apollo 13. Gentlemen, we've given our guys enough to survive till re-entry. Well done. Now we got to get them in. Brad Pitt was a mental patient who had a weird message for a time traveler in 12 Monkeys. She knew I was going to lead the army of the 12 Monkeys into the pages of history before it ever even occurred to me. She knows everything I'm ever going to do before I know it myself. Tim Roth played an effete villain who turned out to be a deadly sword fighter in Rob Roy. And Kevin Spacey spun an amazing story out of thin air in The Usual Suspects. And like that... Gone. Underground. Nobody's ever seen him since. He becomes a myth. A spook story that criminals tell their kids at night. Rat on your pop, and Kaiser says they will get you. And Gene would vote for James Cromwell and Babe. Yes, that farmer. I think Tim Roth made a marvelous villain in Rob Roy, but I'm picking James Cromwell as the good hearted, amazed farmer in Babe because I think this role presented a far greater challenge. How do you, as an actor, relate to a pig, a real one and a mechanical one? Then filled the night 
Deep in moonshine. Now here, I think, is a classic moment in film history where, filled with almost fatherly concern for the pig, the farmer tries to nurse his ailing porker back to hell. That jig goes on, and that is pure acting by James Cromwell, expressing joy and love in a character who is really a man of few words, and up till then, little apparent emotion. I just don't know how you can watch Babe and not think this was a brilliant piece of original, uncharted acting. Easily, I think, the year's best supporting performance. Well, Gene, I enjoy it very much, but on the other hand, I don't know how much of it was acting. Eighty percent of the dialogue in this movie is said by the animals, and as right. you mentioned yourself, James Cromwell has very little acting. Very I little. think, in a way, what you may be responding to is the essence of his being, the person that he is, is just right for that role, but right. I'm not sure that it's really acting in the conventional sense of the word. Well, on that basis, of course, those people in the silent movies, I guess, weren't actors. Well, they certainly were, because uh, they were not doing what I'm describing James Cromwell as. Well, actor. they were doing essence without dialogue, because they were, you couldn't hear them talking. Okay, then I'll approach it in a different way. Maybe what a lot of movie actors do is essence without dialogue. Will you admit that? Yeah, I think it is, and I'm going to pick another one later on in this show, who I think does a great job not talking very okay, much. Okay, why don't you look in that envelope? Okay. <laughs> If you can't beat him, tell him to open the envelope. <laughs> Roger's pick for Best Supporting Actor, Tim Roth and Rob Roy, my second choice. That's right, Tim Roth. And uh, to tell you the truth, I think I made this selection last April, the first time I saw Rob Roy, because his performance, Tim Roth's performance, was so strange and colorful and original. You think me a gentleman because I have linen and can manage a lift? Great villains are essential to great melodrama, and Tim Roth is like a secret ingredient in Rob Roy. He plays Cunningham, the dishonest protege of a powerful nobleman who looks a feat in his frilly costumes and curly wigs, but that's a disguise, and it conceals one of the deadliest sword fighters in England. Here he is in a duel with Liam Neeson in the best movie sword fight I've ever seen. These days, the stars get 15 million bucks for a picture and the character actors fade into the woodwork, but not Tim Roth. I think Rob Roy was actually a better film about Scott's history than Braveheart, but whether it was or not, it's interesting that the only acting nomination won by either film went to Tim Roth. Well, I've already told you that that was my second choice. I'm not going to say a single negative thing about Tim Roth's performance because there isn't anything negative to say. It's terrific and it's also physical as well as verbal. Um, I'm... I'm just repeating, I guess, what I would say is that I felt that, you know, there have been other heavy-duty villains in this kind of picture. Mm -hmm. He's as good as there's ever been. Well, I just felt that Cromwell was going off into unknown territory and did a beautiful job. Now, if Cromwell is the supporting actor, does that mean yeah. that Babe lost out in the actor category? You bet. I think that uh, Babe really was rooked. Okay, when we come back, one of our favorite categories, Best Original Song. Now, back to the Performance Center at the Disney Institute. Siskel and Ebert, if we pick the winner. Welcome back to our annual celebration of those Oscar nominees we would vote for if we were members of the Motion Picture Academy. Our next category is Best Song, and the nominees are... Are the people who look and think like you. Colors of the Wind from Pocahontas. Music by Alan Menken, lyric by Stephen Schwartz. Have you ever heard the wolf cry to the blue horn moon? Or ask the grinning bobcat why he grinned? Can you sing with all the voices of the mountains? Can you paint with all the colors of the wind? The title tune from Dead Man Walking. Music and lyric by Bruce Springsteen. The pale horse coming. I'm going to ride it. I'll rise in the morning. My fate decided I'm a dead man walking. 
Have you ever really loved a woman? From Don Juan DeMarco. Music and lyrics by Michael Kamen, Brian Adams, and Robert John Lang. Moonlight from Sabrina. Music by John Williams. Lyric by Alan and Marilyn Bergman. In the moonlight, all the words you say make it relatively easy to be swept away. And you've got a friend in me you've from Toy Story. Music and lyric by Randy Newman. When the road looks Drop a head in your miles and miles of your nice warm bed. Just remember what your old pal said, boy, you got a friend in me. Yeah, yeah you got a friend in me. Hey, Cowboy. Roger chooses Dead Man Walking from Dead Man Walking, Bruce Springsteen. Right. You know, uh... A lot of times a song in a movie doesn't make an immediate impression on you because you're paying so much attention to other things in the film and only later when you hear it on the radio or see it on television does it start to grow on you. And that was the case for me with Springsteen's, Springsteen's Streets of Philadelphia from two years ago. But in Dead Man Walking, the song made an immediate impression even though the movie itself was so profoundly thought-provoking. Dead Man Walking Once I had a job I had a good Between our dreams and actions lies this world There's an old rule in fiction that you never use your title in your dialogue because it causes a glitch when it comes around the second time. And yet here, the way Springsteen uses Dead Man Walking seems to explain and deepen the significance of the title. And everything about the song music musically seems to perfectly capture the whole tone of the film. As I listen to that song, I think of that film. Well, it does have the title. It is downbeat. Um, I think uh, it's hard to come up with those words and make them sound right, but I didn't make that as my selection. You didn't? Not okay, let me no, see here. I, I didn't consider it one of the two best either. Gene's pick for best song, You've Got a Friend in Me from Toy Story. Yeah. My choice was between You've Got a Friend in Me from Toy Story and Colors of the Wind from Pocahontas, and I'm picking You've Got a Friend in Me because I think it's the more inventive song. And as the years go by, a friendship will never die. You go see it's our death, you got a friend in me. Oh, right. Yeah, you got a friend in me. I, I, I just think his lyrics are so, so inventive. And what I also like about this song is that it's constantly inventive. It's not just main theme, chorus, main theme, chorus. Randy Newman, a most gifted songwriter who's been nominated before and overlooked before. Gene, I think what you're doing here is you're identifying with the lyric of this because it, for some reason, touches something in you in terms of your feelings Always. about toys and children. Yes, and friends yeah, and all those rough, musically, mean subjects. Musically, yeah. musically, this song is not distinguished. It sounds like a clone of a thousand other songs. Name one. If I were to whistle this song to you, you wouldn't be yeah. able to identify it later today. I'm sure you wouldn't. Oh, no, I would. No, I don't it think so. Oh, I think yeah. Dead Man Walking is both as a more distinguished lyric and it's better musically. It, it, and it's also better performed. No, I think it has a more sober quality that you're somehow imbuing with significance. This is lighthearted. It's about toys, mm -hmm. but it isn't lighthearted about toys. It is a tribute to toys. This has the essence of toys. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> and you can bottle that, and it can uh, be sold in the... Uh, it is everywhere department. in the world, okay. and it's bought everywhere when in the world. When we come back, a new category on our show. We've never done this one before. Best Art Director. And then the raccoons ate our food and we all got poison ivy. And that was my vacation. We drive and drive and drive some more. And that was my vacation. After I went to a haunted mansion, I traveled into the future and hung out with famous movie stars. And then I was attacked by aliens, got caught in a tidal wave, and went all the way to China. 
Is that all, Billy? No, but the rest is kind of hard to believe. Call 1-407-W-DISNEY and make the dream come true. In the world of credit cards, the traffic is getting pretty heavy. And it's easy to get confused by all the complicated new card offers and restrictions. But people who know where they're going use one card, Discover Card. With the cashback bonus award, the smart rate program, and no annual fee. For a positive impact on your finances, use the Discover Card. It pays to discover the card that pays you back. Use it where you see the Novus sign. So what's it gonna... Hey, it's you! How old's her? I'm a big fan! Really? Yeah, I just love your dime a minute rate. Oh, well, actually, that's Sprint's dime a minute rate. Don't be so modest. It's great. And it's good forever. You know how I count out my tips now? I take the dimes and I go one minute, two minutes. That's <laughs> nice. I'll have the soup. Hey, Rocco! Look, it's the dime lady! Oh, boy. Sprint's really started something. Call now and get 10 cents a minute across the U.S. and now even to Canada. Northern Kenya being chased by a black rhino. Whoa! Woo. The thing to remember when being chased by a black rhino is that while they're great in the straightaways, they can't corner worth beans. The proceeding has been brought to you by the all-new Nissan Pathfinder, now with increased horsepower. But when you want to get away. Welcome back to the Disney Institute at the Walt Disney World Resort. For Siskel and Ebert's, if we pick the winners. Continuing our Siskel and Ebert special from the Disney Institute, in this segment we're introducing a new category, Best Art Direction and Set Decoration. We've never done this one before. Movies have always specialized in making us believe that completely fictional places really do exist or in recreating historical settings also. But in recent years, with more sophisticated audiences able to spot the flaws more easily, and every teenager can say, oh, look, there's the map drawing, the task of art and set design has become even more highly skilled. This year, we want to choose among the nominees who created and controlled the physical look of five extraordinary pictures. The nominees are... The clock is running! Apollo 13, where the meticulous details of a space launch were recreated by art director Michael Korenblith, and set decorator Meredith Boswell. Babe, where the barnyard looked real and so did the animals despite the fact that it was a set inhabited in great part not by living animals but by special effects. The art direction was by Roger Ford and the set decoration by Kerry Brown. So I go through the kitchen, across the living room, good, good, good. into the bedroom, yeah. get the mechanical roof, yep. and bring it out to you. What about the cat? A Little Princess, where art director Bo Welsh and set decorator Cheryl Karasik created a vast old building that housed a private school where a little girl was lonely but brave. Mama. Sarah, we're not accustomed to delaying everyone's breakfast for one student. I'm sorry, Miss Minchin, but I found my mom... You're not the only child here, Sarah. You must remember that. Restoration, where 17th century England and the court of Charles II were created by art director Eugenio Zanetti. This shall be your lodging. The royal tailors will be continually at your disposal. And Richard III, where Shakespeare's play was set in 1930s England and given a look halfway between Art Deco and Nazi chic. The art director was Tony Burrow. Those are the nominees for Art Direction and Set Decoration. And Gene, if he were a member of the Academy, we'd vote for Roger Ford and Kerry Brown in their, for their work in Babe. Okay. First, let me say that Restoration is magnificent work. I've said it's as good-looking as the Oscar-winning Amadeus in this category, which has sort of been my standard in this field. It's deserving of an Oscar. But there's another look of a film in this category that I think may be more original work. And again, that's Babe, which brings a glow to an Australian farm that reminded me of the epic beauty of, get this comparison, Gone with the Wind. And there are other great outdoor shots, and these shots are the result of art direction, not just cinematography. Now look at the farmhouse, a magical house built for this production, a house that seems to have a life of its own. 
and let's go inside the house. These images are all part of the glowing design of Farm Life in Babe, a luminous, enchanted tale. Now, the uh, set decoration and design of Babe didn't have nearly the budget or the tradition of restoration, but it does have the same integrity of look. You enter a world that doesn't really exist, but you wish it did, and it does for a magical hour and a half. And another thing about that film that's so wonderful is so much of it is really artificial. You don't realize when you're watching it that uh, things, for example, like the hills in the background exactly. of the farmhouse shot are not really there. The sky isn't really there. They're putting together all kinds of things. That's more in the special look, effects yeah. area, but in terms of what they actually had to build... Yeah, they all work together. They work it, together. It, it Why don't you see who I voted for? Okay. Restoration. Yeah, well, it's yeah. a good choice. No question. I would, and... Uh, let, me write, let me say the okay. name of the man. Yeah. Eugenio Zanetti. Hey, I like the name, too. And, Gene, when you were saying that Babe didn't have the budget of Restoration, yeah. I would like to go into that a little more deeply with you. Restoration as a movie, right. totally, only cost $14 million. Right. So I have a feeling that Babe might have had the budget of Restoration. Could actually. be. Okay. Even while I was watching and enjoying the story of Restoration, I was astonished by what a realistic and colorful portrait of the 17th century I was seeing. The king has made other plans for me. All the corners of the frame are filled with details showing the full panoply of London before it was devastated by the plague and the Great Fire. And the film's centerpiece is the amazing opulence of Charles's court. As the characters move from the city to the country, the grandeur of the new era of Charles's restoration moves with them. From the look of the movie, you'd think restoration cost a fortune, but actually it was a relatively low-budget picture, which means that Eugenio Zanetti used great imagination and originality and ingenuity to create these astonishing visions. Yes. Restoration quite simply creates a historical world in all of its sights and all of its sounds and puts it there on the screen for us to walk through. It deserves an Oscar not only for its sets, but as I was watching that clip, for its costumes too. Well, it is a magnificent film. I already compared it to as good as it gets in uh, Amadeus. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess as I looked at all of those films and I said, well, you know what, again, this is beautiful work, but they know what to do. I mean, mm -hmm. the costume shops exist in, in England and all this. They know what to do. And here again, with Babe, I thought, my gosh, if you turn this project over to a lot of people, yes, they would give you a farm, of course, but I don't think they would give you the world of this farm. Well, Gene, I think that's not fair, because after all, they have costume shots in Australia, too, and they know how farmers dress, so no. come on. We haven't really ever seen Restoration England the way we see it in yeah. Restoration. I, I, I mean, don't have a they had negative to, thing to say. They had to create that look from scratch. It's they were not just recycling other ideas. It's spectacular looking. Okay, coming up next, for the first time in years, this category is really competitive this year. We'll take a look at the best actress category when we come back. And now, back to the Performance Center at the Disney Institute, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert. Continuing our special show on who we would choose as the winners of this year's Academy Awards, we now come to a category that in recent years has proved difficult to fill with quality, but not this past year when there were some terrific roles for women. The nominees now for Best Actress are... Did you read anything about Jesus and Obama? Susan Sarandon played the nun caught between the death row killer she counsels and the parents of his victims in Dead Man Walking. I'm just trying to follow the example of Jesus, who said that Every person is worth more than their worst act. Elizabeth Shue was the hooker who falls in love with a dying drunk in Leaving Las Vegas. Why don't you stay at my place tonight? I mean, look, you're pretty drunk. Sharon Stone clawed her way up from hustler to wealthy but unhappy mob wife in Casino. About 10000 Why don't you knock it off, Sam? I'm just trying to figure it out. Nothing to figure out. I'm home. We're working it out. Meryl Streep played a bored Italian-American farm wife who discovered passion with a globetrotting photographer in the bridges of Madison County. Stop. Tell me now. It doesn't matter. 
And Emma Thompson played the eldest Dashwood sister, perhaps too sensible for her own good, in Sense and Sensibility. After all, it is bewitching in the idea of one's happiness entirely depending on one person. It is not always possible, we must accept. Roger's choice in this very good category, leaving Las Vegas, Elizabeth Shue. That's right. For me, this race came down to Susan Sarandon and Elizabeth Shue, and I selected Shue for the same reason I selected her co-star, Nicolas Cage, because the performance had the greatest emotional impact on me. I can rationalize my choice on an intellectual level. I probably will later, but I made it because of what happened right in here. So, Ben, with an end. <laughs> Brings you to Las Vegas. Business convention? She plays a woman who is bruised and hardened. She has to be cynical all day long. But maybe she feels a deep need to take care of someone, to be important, not because of sex, but because of the love that she can give. She finds a man like that, and then watch how her face is a window to her soul in this scene as she is so deeply hurt by his insulting behavior. I'll help you. You'll be able to feel it sharp and hot from your ear as one of the brothers is putting your head face down into one of the penthouse pillows. They begin with two movie cliches, a drunk and a hooker, and they turn them into two of the most unforgettable characters I've ever seen in the movies. And in a way, Shu's job is harder because she isn't drunk. She's really there. She's alert. She's thinking, even during the really out-of-control moments. And her warmth is what makes the relationship and the movie work. Yes, it's true. It's love. And she's able to declare it. And I think she does a beautiful job. Open my envelope. Okay. I will. If you will, please. It will be either Elizabeth Shue or Meryl Streep for The Bridges of Madison yeah. County. My choice was between Elizabeth Shue and Meryl Streep in The Bridges of Madison County, but I'm picking Meryl Streep's work because it is a silent piece of work, mostly a great achievement, especially for our greatest contemporary actress who normally does so well with accents. Michael! Colleen! Meet your dinner! In the case of her Italian-born housewife on an Iowa farm, there is a trace of Europe in Streep's voice. But what I most remember about her, Francesca, is the way Streep silently communicates her loneliness with a gesture or a sigh. She communicates her excitement at meeting a stranger by fixing her dress. And here's an extended wordless sequence late in the film as she looks over memorabilia from her enchanted four days with this lover. Streep in the Bridges of Madison County, a master at work. She doesn't need dialogue to tell us everything we need to know about her character. No, she doesn't, and it is a, a great performance, and there are so many good performances in this category that I think the Oscar voters are probably actually going to have to do something they don't do every year, think. and look, look at all five movies and think about them. Coming up next, the big one you've all been waiting for, Best Picture. Walt Disney Home Video presents the Music and Movie Event of the Year. Come on, Nico. Nominated for three Grammys, two Academy Awards, and a two-time Golden Globe winner, including Best Song. And you'll never hear the wolf cry to the blue moon. Bring home the fun and adventure of one of the best films of the year. It's mine, mine, mine for the taking. By Disney's Pocahontas, on sale for a limited time. This is more like it. Soon I'll be far away from anyone who's ever even heard of 10 cents a minute from Sprint. 10 cents a minute? One thin dime. A dime a minute is a wonderful deal. And it's good forever. It's as simple as that. Simple as that. Simple as that. To think. After all my work, I'll be remembered as the dime lady. But I'm not going to think about that. That's why I'm taking this little trip to Hawaii. <laughs> Call now to get 10 cents a minute across the U.S. and now even to Canada. 
How do you get clean and fresh? Jurgen's body shampoo. I get so much lather. I mean, you really, really can feel the clean. And it rinses clean without soap film. Totally refreshing. How refreshing is it? You feel fresh. You come out with some bounce in your step. This freshness is fabulous. Sounds like you love the clean, fresh feeling. Showers will never be the same. I just feel incredibly clean. I'm never going to let you go. Jurgen's body shampoo. Now in a new moisturizing formula. Another beautiful idea from today's Jurgen's. Before we do anything else, we gotta meet Mickey. He invented Disney World. Sure, I wanna do Thunder Mountain. I'm definitely riding Dumbo. But first, I gotta talk to Mickey. I gotta meet the mouse. And after that, off to Adventureland. But not until I meet... <gasps> Call 1407W-Disney and make the dream come true. He says hi. That Mickey, I can talk to him all day. And now, back to the Performance Center at the Disney Institute. Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert. Continuing our special program, we picked the winners. It's time now for the most important category. Here are the nominees for Best Picture of the Year. Our RCS isn't up here yet. We have no attitude control on Aquarius. Ron Howard's Apollo 13 used human drama and astonishing special effects in the story of a doomed space mission. with a dead elephant on our back. Chris Noonan made a moving and funny story out of Babe, a technical triumph because of the way he made animals into convincing characters. Right. Humans don't eat roosters. Why? They make eggs with their hands and wake everyone up in the morning. Right. I tried it with their hands, it didn't work. So I turned to crowing and lo, I discover my gift. But no sooner do I become indispensable than they bring in a machine to do the job. Oh, the treachery of it. A mechanical rooster. Oh, dear me. Oh, dear you. Braveheart was Mel Gibson's triumph. He not only started it, but directed its epic battle scenes and convincing special effects. Go back to England and tell them there that Scotland's daughters and her sons are yours no more. Tell them Scotland is free. Michael Radford's The Postman was the first foreign language film to break into the top five since Ingmar Bergman's Cries and Whispers in 1973. Ecco fatto. Hai già trovato la tua poesia. And Ang Lee's Sense and Sensibility, Sensibility was nominated in a year when the movies rediscovered the charm and the bite of Jane Austen. Would you stay in London? I hate London. No peace. Uh, a country living is my idea, a small parish where I might do some good. Keep chickens. Give very short sermons. <laughs> And if Gene had a vote, it would go to Babe. <laughs> Only two of the five nominated pictures made my top ten list. Apollo 13 was number seven, and number four on my list, and thus my choice among the nominees, is Babe. I guess you can tell from the show I really love Babe. It does hold up to repeated viewing, and the second time around, you really pick up on the very first narrated line from the film, that it's the story, essentially a fable, of an unprejudiced heart. Actually, I think two hearts. The heart of a little pig who loves every creature and of a farmer who refuses to categorize his animals. Now, over here like this. And then, big hook to the left. Big hook to the left. Through this guy here. It was at that time that Mrs. Hoggett began to worry about her husband. But Farmer Hoggett knew that little ideas that tickled and nagged and refused to go away should never be ignored, for in them lie the seeds of destiny. Close the gate, like that, and you're done. Babe is a classic, wholly original. I'm so happy the Academy membership is considering it for Best Picture of the Year. At first I thought its nomination was maybe some kind of protest vote against an indifferent year for film, but no. The excellence and originality of Babe is what got it a Best Picture nod. I hope it wins. Babe is an extraordinary picture, and you know the National Society of Film Critics picked it as the Best Picture of the Year. I think because it shows that imagination still has a role in making great pictures. It's yeah. not just how big of a star you have, how big of a budget you have, or how commercial your high concept is. Exactly right. Imagination is very important, and it is a wonderful picture. I wouldn't say a word against it. 
but I'm not going to select it. It comes out of nowhere. Yes, it does. Uh, and it really, and it is, it's pure imagination. It is magical. One footnote, it's not just for kids. Absolutely yeah, not. Because... I think adults will enjoy it more. Okay. Okay. And your pick, Apollo 13. Right. Uh, and for me, this particular vote didn't take a lot of thought, since Apollo 13 was the only one of the five nominees that made my best ten list of the year's top films. I thought the film was a remarkable combination of the technical and the human. So, come on, we've got to be able to give these guys something up there. Without the power, we can't give them a reading. We're not talking about power, we're talking about references. No, no, there's no references. We have a bunch of debris up there. Houston, what's the story with this burn? We're trying to hash something out down here, Aquarius. Stand by. Well, now look, Houston, all we need to hold attitude is one fixed point in space. Is that not correct? Yeah, roger that, Jim. Well, Houston, we've got one. Apollo 13 painted the sort of big canvas that Ron Howard specializes in. He likes ensemble stories where a lot of characters work together. And here he was able to overcome all sorts of technical challenges from weightlessness to a cramped space capsule set to the fact that the audience already knew how the story was going to end. He held our attention, he moved us, and Apollo 13 is my choice from the five best film nominees. Well, I, I had it seven on my list, so you know I like this yeah. picture a great deal. I think you mentioned the key thing here, Ron Howard, mm -hmm. who was not nominated no. as Best Director. That's amazing, because if anything is great about this picture, it's the direction, because of all that he had to do physically. Big group of actors, special effects, supervising tons of details mm -hmm. to make this thing look authentic when we have so many close-up video images of the space program and of these real people. You know, uh, Howard made a real point uh, right when the film came out, came out of saying there's not a single shot in this movie that comes from newsreel footage. It's a great piece of work. I have seen other great space program pictures, if you will, and those would include 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Right Stuff. Mm -hmm. I have never seen anything like Babe. It's a good picture. Oh, it's a good picture, babe. Okay, thank you very much, Gene. Okay. Thank you for that. For that. Okay, well, in that case, when we come back, a category you will never see on the Academy Awards, the year's worst nomination. From the Performance Center at the Disney Institute, once again, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert. category that is unique to our Oscar special. You certainly never find this one on the Oscar <laughs> telecast. Roger and I each picked the worst nomination given out this year by the Academy, the biggest miscarriage of justice, and Roger selects Emma Thompson nominated for Best Actress in Sense and Sensibility. You don't think she deserved it? No, I don't. That's right. Emma Thompson, I'll tell you why. If the voters had really done their homework, they would have known that Emma Thompson deserved to be nominated this year for her much superior, brilliant, daring performance in a much better film named Carrington. Here's the moment when she first voices her love for the homosexual writer, Lytton Strachey. What do you think we ought to do about the physical? I don't mind about that. Ah, but you should. Okay, and Jean's vote for the worst nomination of the year. This is always my favorite category. <laughs> I'm sure the actors love this too. Yeah. Whoa, Sharon Stone nominated for Best Actress in Casino. Yeah, I don't think that Sharon Stone in Casino delivered one of the five best performances of the year. Not in a year in which two actresses, Nicole Kidman in To Die For and Annette Bening in The American President, revealed new depth of their talent in comic roles of varying intensity. I think Sharon Stone was adequate in Casino as a Class A schemer who tries to go legit as a casino boss's wife. She's lively, and then she has a big crying scene, the kind of crying scene that gets you an Oscar nomination. Look at this. That's all you care about. You don't care about me at Yes, I do. No, you don't. How could you say that? She's glamorous, she's strong, and she cried for us. Oh, that's acting. I never cared for her character. I always saw Sharon Stone acting in sort of a generic, big-time, hustler, hooker way. And now, Roger, I have a question for you. On Oscar night, whose name would you like to be called, or what picture's name would you like to be called that you're going to jump up and pound the desk? What would make me the happiest of all would be Joan Allen for supporting actress for Nixon. And really? I'll tell you why. Go ahead. I think this picture deserves to be looked at as a movie. It was jumped on by all of the Washington columnists yeah, who Nixon criticized family. it for its history and for its politics. None of them had any way of relating to it as a movie, and it, they totally missed it as one of the great American films of the year. I'd like more attention to it, and especially to her performance in it. Mm -hmm. And you? 
I would pick anyone associated with Babe, and that would be. <laughs> It could be a great capper to an Oscar night. Okay, that's it for the 1996 edition of If We Pick the Winners. And until Oscar night, the envelopes are sealed. Production venue provided by the Disney Institute. Disney's new vacation experience where you can do things you've always wanted to do and try things you never even thought about doing. Going to rent some Oscar-winning movies this year? then you'll want the brand new 96 edition of Roger Ebert's Video Companion. It's got a separate pocket video guide, too. The Iced Teapot by Mr. Coffee. The easy way to enjoy fresh brewed iced tea made just the way you want it. The Iced Teapot. Discover the game of knowledge. The educational quiz game for children and their parents, too. The game of knowledge from University Games. Discover a whole new world online with America Online, the easy, fun way to explore. To get your free 15-hour trial with no obligation, call 1-800-641-9900. Give it a try.